Hello and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Sammy Roth. I'm Rosie Murphy and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. This week we've got Season 6, Episode 7, Dr. Linus. Michael Emerson, who you heard from a couple weeks ago, is back with us to talk about what Ben is experiencing uh, on both timelines in this episode. And he calls this episode a poignancy machine, which I think is an apt description, and I am very excited to get into it. Absolutely. Let's talk. Let's start with our hottest takes of the week, as we typically do. Rosie, what do you got on hot takes for Dr. Linus? I completely forgot that the way this episode ends is with this very silly cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, it's it like, great. Oh, it's gimmicky. Oh. I did like it, and my hot take is that I really, really like it. But okay. to, to Michael's point, you're having this poignancy machine. There's this montage with this like incredibly light touch piano music under it. Excellent Chikino there, where, by the way. Yeah, and Ben has clearly just had this sort of personal awakening where he has overcome his will to power and decided to, you know, simply live among these people and and it's amazing and then the camera zooms out and the music changes and you see this little periscope pop up from under the water it's hilarious yeah just really it really made me laugh i forgot that that was coming that's funny i you know i i had more of a reaction of just like this is a moment of like oh shit stuff's about to get crazy like widmore showing up like what is happening here but i i like your funny interpretation and not to get like too far ahead of ourselves I'll just, you know, tease here that one of the comments that Michael Emerson makes in our, our conversation with him this week is that is that to him, like, a lot of what they're doing in the sixth season, he he feels like, he said, he says something to the effect of, like, it, it feels almost comedic at times or not to be mm-hmm. taken so seriously in a way that previous seasons didn't. He says that in reference to Terry O'Quinn playing, like, a different character. But I wonder if that applies to this moment. Because you're right, I hadn't thought about it, but, but it, it's dramatic, but so dramatic that it is kind of funny. And just the sh- the single shot of the periscope just going boop. There's no way for <laughs> me to see it as anything other than funny, which you, is great. You know what else um, is funny? Speaking of the poignancy of that last moment, even even within the poignant montage, Miles examining the diamond, and you're realizing that he actually yeah. dug up Nikki and Paolo's grave to yep. get the diamond. Like, oh man. Anyway, what is your hot take? So, um, mine is so. It, I, I'm 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 pretty much playing my type at this point. Like this is an amazing, amazing episode. This is one of the best episodes. That, I mean, this is this is great. I mean, I love yes. everything about this. The is one there a thing, butt coming? yeah, the one thing that could have made this episode even better, even better. Not not that it wasn't already great. If we had seen previously, or were still previously going to see Alana's backstory with Jacob. Mm. That would have made it all the more poignant because the Ben stuff is so perfect. But when Alana is talking about Jacob was the closest thing I ever had to a father and seeing the grief that she's going through, you know, doing this sort of incredibly horrendous thing to Ben, Mm -hmm. powerful as it was just as Ben's story, it would have been even more powerful if we had really felt what Alana was feeling there, either because we'd already seen it or on rewatch because, you know, we'd seen it once before and knew it was coming. That, That would have made it even better. I agree. I think Alana comes off as a little bit two dimensional to me. Yeah. Um, And like, and sometimes that's the way it has to be because we just, there's not enough time to learn everything about everyone. But I found myself kind of looking away during her scenes a little bit, being a little bit less engaged just because it's like, there's so much other, to your point, so much other heavy stuff happening inside Ben with Richard and Jack that in those scenes with Alana and Son and Miles and Frank, I was sort of like, okay, you know, let's let's keep it moving. Yeah, and it's um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull a baseball uh, uh, comparison here, but it's kind of like the Dodgers right now. They're the best team in the league. They're firing on all cylinders, and yet you know they could still be better. There's a mm-hmm. couple places where, as great as they are, there's a reason their manager gave them an A minus grade and not an A plus for the first half of the season. So that that's this episode. It's a fabulous episode, but. It could still have been. It could still have been truly one of the greats if that Alana story had been firing like the rest of it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, where do you want to start? Shit, so much happens. Um, I loved the writing this episode. Like it was very on the nose at times, and I'm sure intentionally so. Right. But, the but... the opening lesson that Ben's teaching is about Napoleon. Yes. Going into exile. 
oh, okay, yes, he, we're making it obvious. He literally says, without his power, he might as well have been dead. <laughs> Which, and there's example after example of that, mm-hmm. but it's like, but they work because right. they're so true to Ben's character. And also just there are so many good speeches this episode. Like Ben has several good speeches. Like Jack has a good speech. Richard has a good speech. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I was just, I was digging the writing. I just want to get that out of the way. Good, good work by Eddie Kitsis and Adam Horowitz who wrote this mm-hmm. one. Let's kind of, you know, compare and contrast Island Ben to Sideways Ben, yeah, right? Yeah, that's a good call. Island Ben is finally, he is a man with no cards left to play, and he finally recognizes it and has to give up on, even when John comes to him and says, I can finally give you the thing that you really want. It's very, it's almost very biblical, right? It's like the devil coming to him and tempting him with Mm. power because it's what he deserves and he will be a righteous leader and blah, blah, blah. And Ben almost does it. And then all Alana has to do is say, where will you go? To Locke. Why? Because he's the only one that'll have me. I'll have you. Yeah, he's so low that such a, even a tiny, tiny yeah. act of con- kindness, he's like a flower responding to the sun. Yeah, and at the end, I mean, it's it's kind of pitiable where he lands, but he does seem to be, like, ready to give up on power of any kind. I mean, you talk about wanting to compare Ben and the, the island to Ben and the sideways, but it's like, you know, one of the other great bits of dialogue this week is when Ben asks Locke, What do you mean I should be the principal? just sounds like you care about this place. And if the man in charge doesn't, then maybe it's time for a change. I appreciate the sentiment, but who's going to listen to me? I'm listening. I mean, I want to talk about what that means in terms of Jacob, but like... Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is all Ben's ever wanted, and that power and he's offered that chance in the sideways where he's never had it and he jumps at it. It's like, oh shit, maybe this is my thing. Um, and he has to, and and, you know, and he learns to, that he doesn't need that, that there are other things that are more important, but it's, you know, where he goes through that in the space of one episode and, you know, a couple of days in the flash Mm -hmm. sideways, it's been a process of years and years and trauma and tragedy and heartbreak to get there in his real life. And, and I think you're right. We finally see it happen this episode. Yeah. Like he's, he's hit so far below rock bottom that this is the first time he can really truly consider like, maybe this isn't the thing for me. One of the things that I just thought was so, I know, powerful about the flash sideways, Ben, he's so sympathetic. Like yeah. he really has a good heart. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk with Emerson about that in a bit. So I don't want to spoil it, but you know, he seems to think that, that Ben has had this good heart all along and it's just been buried so deep beneath so much other crap that he's been convinced of or convinced himself of. And I think this is the first time you really see it when all of that is stripped away. Like, he really wants to help children. Yeah. Like, that's all he cares about. Even, you know, compared to Arst, who, you know, likes the summer vacation and wants a good parking spot for the most part. <laughs> and Ben wants to help these kids. It's yeah. It's about as pure as it gets, you know? But yeah, it does seem to be kind of a purist in his belief in what they're doing, which was he on the island? You know, was he pure and sincere in his belief that he was doing good or right? Hmm. I don't know. I well, think it, at times, certainly. Right. But it, I guess it sort of became hard to differentiate between when was he trying to do good and when was he trying to serve his own ends versus convincing himself that, you know, the, the former had to do with the latter or vice versa. Well, and he he talks about that a little bit when he gives the speech about um, Alex's death. I had a chance to save her, but I chose the island over her, all in the name of Jacob. I sacrificed everything for him, but the thing that really mattered was already gone. All in the name of Jacob. I sacrificed everything for him and he didn't even care. Yeah, and so I killed him. (laughs) You know, goaded by the man in black, but still, like, 
fair enough. Um, well, hmm. But yeah, I mean, I think he he feels a deep betrayal. And Richard, I mean, Richard is very similar in this episode, right? They feel this sense of what the fuck was the man in charge doing the whole time? <laughs> you know, he has left us with nothing and with no map. And it turns out we didn't even know what was on the real map the whole time. You know, we never knew what Jacob was up to and he never cared about us. I spent my whole life serving this thing only to find out that it, it meant nothing. Yeah. I mean, three three different things popped into my head that I want to respond to. I mean, one is just that like, the line you referenced where, where Richard says, uh, you know, he told me that everything was happening for a reason. He had a plan. And when the time he's right, he, he when the time was right, he'd share it with me. It's like, yep. my God, he's been doing this for 140 years. And he was waiting the whole time for Jacob to tell him the plan. Like, what the actual fuck? Yeah. I mean, what the fuck? So it's, uh, that's one, it's amazing Richard didn't rebel before now. That's one thing. Yeah. Two, it's just, it's interesting to see Richard has gone to this, you know, this, I mean, this, as dark a place as it can get. I mean, he's trying to kill himself. Um, ben does not go to that place, which is interesting. Ben has lost everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, not necessarily more than Richard. I mean, Richard lost his wife, but that was before he came to the island. You know, Ben has lost his daughter, the only person he ever cared about in the service of Jacob. And he does still seem to have a pretty strong desire to live this week. I mean, he's digging his own grave, but he he badly wants to escape. He's trying to bargain mm-hmm. his way out. It just, you know, this is it, it's not a it's not a criticism of Richard or you know a, you know any comparison between them necessarily. It's just it's interesting to see Richard has sort of lost all desire to go on living, and Ben, for whatever reason, still has that within him. He he still sees something in his future, which I find interesting. I mean, Richard is cursed, right? Like True. he's cursed with immortality, basically, and like he was given this gift that he didn't really want. That was kind of a, a joke. And Jacob's like, okay, I, I can do that. You know, we have Abiturno in a couple of weeks. We'll get into it. But, um, yeah, we will. And now, now he's just stuck. He has to go on living forever for nothing. Like that's ter That's gotta be terrifying. Whereas with Ben, I wonder if there is a sense of, I still have some time, what can I do with that time? Mm, right. Um, he, has, he hasn't been at this for a hundred and you know forty years like Richard has. Right. You know, I'm. I don't know if he's quite at the point of like I want to make amends, but I think he is at the point of like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I yeah. Want something else. Well, so this. I mean, this gets back to the other point you made that I wanted to bring up is you know did did Ben on the island believe that he was really doing good at any point? Mm-hmm. Did he and. I referenced this line earlier, but the line where Locke in the flash sideways says to him, you know, it just sounds like you care about this place. And if the man in charge doesn't, right. then maybe it's time for a change. You know, one of these on the nose lines, he's obviously talking about the school literally, but it's a reference to the island. And, it, you know, what it made me think with regards to Ben and to Jacob was that, you know, did Ben really care about the island, about the place? Did he care about it potentially even in a way more or greater than Jacob did? I, I don't know if I believe this or not, but I'm going to sort of try out this argument and, and see yeah. how we feel about it. Like last week and the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how it, it doesn't really seem like Jacob cared that much about the place or about the people on it. I mean, his mother told him he had to, but really it it seemed like what motivated him was proving his brother wrong and stopping his brother. Whereas Ben, you know, he comes to this island and does lots of terrible shit, but it's the only place he, he ever felt at home, the only place he ever felt loved, the only place he ever felt like he had a purpose. Like, I kind of wonder if there's a case to be made here that, yeah, actually, Ben Ben cared about this place maybe in a, in a way that Jacob never did. I think that theory is supported by what Ben says to his father in The Flash Sideways, or what his father says to him, rather, where he, he mentions, remember the Dharma Initiative, I wonder sometimes, you know, what your life would have become if we'd stayed on that island. Mm. Um, mm. this is like a very literal interpretation of the alternate timeline in that um, Ben could have had Ben's life if they had stayed on the island, but instead they left, you know, before Ben met the others, before he met Richard, before he killed his father and everyone else. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not, not really going anywhere yeah. in particular with that, but I think it, it backs up what you're suggesting about Ben did actually care about the island in the same way that he cares about this school, mm. even though there's a mm. sense of like, 
you know, is this my my dream, my grand vision? Do I feel that this is what I'm meant for? Like maybe not, but it's the lot that I have and I want to I still care about it, yeah. you know? Well, I feel like what really supports that long term is is his decision at the end of the show to sort of go down, you know, go down with the ship or die trying. Um right. you know, and I I love that he ends up being sort of in charge, but I mean as a number 2 to Hugo like I'd like to think that reflects reflects the fact that he's he's realized that you know maybe he maybe he shouldn't really be the guy in charge like maybe he can serve the island but maybe he maybe he can't actually be entrusted with that power maybe he comes to understand that or maybe after all the bad stuff he did he, he doesn't deserve it anymore but he so it's I don't know it makes me feel watching this episode like actually that's an even even more poignant ending than I've given it credit for that he stays to serve the island that he cares about but not as the man in charge as a servant of the man in charge I think it works yeah. really nicely I, I will say with the talking about the Roger sequence, it was almost too much. I mean, it was such, it was like life affirming to me to see this mm-hmm. reality where mm-hmm. Ben and his father, you know, not only don't hate each other's guts, but like they love and care about each other. Ben's taking care of Roger in his old age. Yeah. Roger is regretful that he couldn't give Ben more like, you know, the, the whole gimmick with the oxygen tanks. It's like, again, on the nose, you know, considering how their story ended with the, you know, with the poison tank and whatever, mm-hmm. but like it really calls out. It's just like I don't know. I just I love it so much. It's it's really really powerful to to be able to see this this little bit with them together. That's so different. I it was very meaningful to me. Yeah, and does perhaps support this idea that like Ben is capable of love, right? He is capable of like human connection, familial connection. Like in every universe, he has you know Alex, sort of a child figure, and he has his father and his relationships with both of them are just so different Mm. in the flash sideways. And I think it's because at least in part, they cannot be used as bargaining chips, right? Like because he has no power, those bonds are not something that can be like threatened in that way or not something he ever has to sacrifice. Like they can just be normal relationships, (laughs) And what what little power he does have over the principal, he chooses not to exercise for her sake. Yeah. yeah, but you know it's funny. You, you, I mean, Roger's saying that I, if only I had gotten you to the island, you might have, you know, you might have been able to make something about yourself if that had worked out. But it's like, you know, it's interesting. The the island might be the thing that Ben cares about the most outside of these people, but it's also the thing that horribly corrupts him. Right. He did make something of himself, and it wasn't good. You know. Like, maybe Ben was always meant to live this sort of quiet life where he can just be a nice guy (laughs) and just power is not for him. No, it's, I mean, I I think beyond just the, you know, the the rich and subtle thematic elements, just like seeing Emerson play this nice guy version of Ben after six years of the show, it's, it it just it, it I, I never get tired of watching it after going through Lost. It's I, I mean Emerson is remarkable, the writing is remarkable, but it's I, I know I already used this this term, but it's life affirming. I mean this yeah. is a show that's you know so much about how people can change and find the best versions of themselves and learn the lessons that they've been trying so hard to learn and and here you go. I mean this is we know this is the Ben that you know he I think Ben has created a flash sideways for himself where where. It, he's the Ben who he kind of wishes he could could have been. Like this feels like an ideal situation for him. Yeah. Where he can, you know, he can live that quiet life that you were just describing. He can be with Alex. We got a hot take on this. Yes. Yeah. This is from our listener, Karina. Hi, my name is Karina. I am from Argentina. I always listen to your podcast. I just listen to Lighthouse. And I just wanted to comment about Ben's uh, other life. I think he he remained in. He didn't went into the church because he wanted to stay more time with his with his daughter. Anyway, it's just for that. I love you. I love the podcast. I have the numbers of lost tattoo in my in my arm. And um, thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I think this is really interesting. This is not something that had ever occurred to me that people could could choose to wait to go into the church but the idea that maybe maybe Ben was meant to be there with Alex and maybe also Rousseau 
Yeah, and I think that I mean I think the idea is supported by uh, by Miss Hawking, who we we see once more time with um, yeah. you know with her son Daniel. So I, I think there's precedent for it. Um, but yeah, it it makes perfect sense to me. Like I think he's actually created here a reality that he wants to spend time in, and yeah. he's and like he says, he it's not just it's not just out of a selfish purpose. I mean, he's still working out his issues, as he says at the end. Um, so there's like a reason metaphysically for him to be here. But I, I, yeah, I also think it has to do with just wanting to have this chance that he denied himself. And, and maybe that's important to working out his issues. But I, you know, I, I think he just, yeah, he wants to spend more time in this place. And I, I, I don't, I don't judge him for that. I'd like yeah. him to have more time in this place. Yeah, I, you watch this episode and you think he deserves to be this guy for a while. And I want to jump back to what you mentioned earlier about like, this is the life he would have imagined for himself. I don't know if that's true because I think the life he would have imagined for himself would have had more credentials, like more markers of success. Like Mm. I imagine, you know, when I think about Ben Linus in season three, who's running his book club and playing his piano and all this, like, I feel like if you asked that person, who would you be if you weren't here? He would say, oh, I would have been... A prestigious professor at Harvard who writes, you know, well-regarded books on history and music. Exactly, exactly. Right. And he's, I, I think there's a lot of humility in that, in that this is the life he ended up creating for himself. Like Maybe in a way it's a way he feels like it's the life he deserves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he does get to be with the people he cares about and he gets to be with his daughter and maybe even find some love at the end. But yeah, I, th- I think it goes back to, to the point about, you know, like he probably thought he didn't deserve to be the man in charge at the end. Like, yeah, I think he, he definitely seems to come to terms with like the idea this is his lot in life and that's not a mm-hmm. bad thing. Yeah. He's learning to let go. Isn't he? Yes. Yeah. And to even maybe let go of the idea of deservingness, right? Like mm. there's so much, that's such a loaded phrase, right? Like this is what I deserve. This is what is just and right and because I have done X, I ought to get Y. And I think part of letting go for Ben is letting go of that and just saying, like, yes, I have done X, but I'm just not meant to have Y. And, like, the input does not necessarily lead to the output, and that is just the way it's going to go. That'd be a good lesson for a lot of us to learn, not speaking yeah. from personal experience or anything. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, should we should we talk a little bit about Richard and Jack? Um, Richard, Richard or Jack, who's your, I mean, they're, they're, they're part and parcel this episode. Right. I think the scene that they have together in the Black Rock is tremendous. Fucking incredible. It's heavy. It's intense. Both of them are like desperate in very different ways. I mean, we see Jack here. Jack risks his own life Mm -hmm. by saying, I don't think that's going to go off because I think I'm here. You know, I'm trusting Jacob now. Well, th- this feels like the moment where Jack is finally starting to f- to find himself in a real way. I mean, and I, I wrote yeah. this down in capital letters, and I'll, I'll you know I know this is my shtick as of two minutes ago in all seasons. Like this is Jack letting go, right? Like he's mm-hmm. he's literally giving up control. He's he's putting his life in God's hands, right? Is what he's doing. Yes. You know, with Jacob as God, he's saying, you know, I trust this figure that's been watching me my whole life has a plan for me. Like I trust in in him that I am not going to die in this moment because this is not my purpose, Jack. You know, the, totally the complete right. control freak man of science is completely washing his hands of that here and giving up and saying, I'm putting my faith in a higher power and mm-hmm. letting go of my own control of events. And he's rewarded for it. Yeah. Whereas we have Richard, who is at the other end of that journey, saying, I thought it, I kept the faith for all that time and I got nothing. I, talking about the great writing this episode, I cracked up, and this is the funny point again, after after the fuse burns down and they close their eyes and nothing happens, Jack says, want to try another stick? <laughs> yeah. It made me laugh. Well, and it's interesting. I That felt to me like, oh, shoot, Jack had faith and it paid off. Like, how, empower, how empowering for Jack. Um, you know, it it's still a gamble to make that choice and say, I don't think this is going to go off. And he had enough faith to make it. But once you're proven right, oh my mm, goodness, you know, mm. that's got to solidify you on that path. I mean, this is the moment for Jack. It, and it's interesting that it doesn't take place in his his episode. Like Lighthouse mm. was kind of the setup for this, like the yeah. one that had him really made him stop and slow down. 
But this is the payoff of Lighthouse right here. Yeah. A couple of quick quick things about characters who just appeared in here that are worth talking about. Principal Reynolds, um, mm. apparently uh, played by a fairly well-known actor named William Atherton, who I don't know a lot about, but I guess he was in, um, according to Lostpedia, I mean, he was, in, he was in Ghostbusters and he was in Die Hard. And apparently Lostpedia says that this role was written with him in mind specifically, which is uh, interesting. interesting. I mean, he, he does a great job at being a complete schmuck. I mean, you hate him basically from the moment he, he's on screen to the moment he's off of it. He's terrible. Oh, yes. Um, you know, I mean, he doesn't care about the kids at all. He's like the opposite of Ben. Why don't we listen to Michael Emerson talk about this episode a bit? I think that is a fantastic idea. Let's do it. Since we're talking about the writing, one thing that I, that I particularly found myself enjoying was all of the, all of the sort of, you know, like, subtle comparisons just between events that happened in Ben's previous life and this one. Like in the original timeline, you kill your father with a gas canister and here you are sort of adjusting his oxygen tank and it looks like a similar device. And there, there were a couple of, there were a couple of things like that, that, uh, you know, De Rousseau, uh, Mira Furlan makes a joke about needing to kidnap you, which uh, of course references the original timeline. Just that, you know, and, with some writers, that would feel like it's way too on the nose and, and kind of harsh, but I, I smiled at every single one of them. Yeah, me too. And, and as you say, that, that episode is just loaded with those parallelisms. Yeah. And they're, and they're rich, and they thought so carefully about, and they thought so carefully about what a different life would have been if Ben's path had been different. And then they were careful to make those comparisons in plausible ways that were true to what we think is Benjamin's essential character. In, in neither of those lives or worlds is he a cutthroat guy. He's not a good hardball player. But in one case, in the case where he allows himself his goodness or tenderness in the one where the daughter figure he's able to help her rather than to doom her i i think it's just it's a it's really an uplifting kind of comparison with with something like real life messaging in it i think which is do, don't do things that feel unnatural to you. Don't, don't try to play in a league that isn't normal for you or natural or that doesn't have heart because it may be a bad bargain. And he makes bad bargains in both lives, but they're not deadly in the Dr. Linus life. Well, now I've got to dig into this, and we've gone totally off the rails here right away, but this is great. Um, I, I, I'm so curious. So you, you think that deep down, after watching Dr. Linus, that, that Ben actually is, that he has heart and that he's not the cutthroat, manipulative person that he's always trying to be? You, you don't think that's his essence? No, I, I think it was a thing he, it was a thing he had to talk himself into. Uh, a bill of goods that he bought about Jacob and about himself and about the satisfactions of power and control. And they turn out to be meaningless. As, as he says in that speech in the jungle, he, he, made, he made bad choices. He gambled with the best things he had in his life and he lost he was he was careless until he loses everything and then then he knows then he has an awakening yeah i'm, I'm reading the dialogue here and your line was uh, i was terrified that i was about to lose the only thing that had ever mattered to me my power but the thing that really mattered was already gone it's a it's a pretty epic realization because it undercuts everything about who ben thought he was yeah yeah it's yeah. good and it and it the way it plays out 
him saying, she says, where, where will you go? And he says, I'll, I'll go to Locke. Why? Because he's the only one that will have me. And then it's so lovely when she says, I'll have you. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, you know, this is, again, since we're just going there, um, you have these scenes with Zuleika Robinson, this episode, who plays Alana. It's, it's pretty brutal. I mean, she makes you dig your own grave. And there are all, yeah. of, these, there are all of these shots of you just standing there, you know, looking looking totally bad and you're not even digging with a shovel. It's like a hollowed out tree branch or something. And they, they cut back to you again and again, looking miserable. What, what was that like to film? What was it like working with Zuleika? It looks like it was probably a physically pretty draining story. It was, it was a hot day yeah. and the sun was hot. And I always had a, a few too many clothes on for the weather. It seemed like both on the show and in real life. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was rough. That was real sweat. And, and of course, you're, you know, you're leaking, you know, wound makeup all over the place. <laughs> Sand is in your mouth and in your ears and in your shoes. And <laughs> but it was, it was cool. And I, I thought, oh, this is a wonderful setup to have the, the guy that everybody has been not liking for seasons of the show and to have him digging <laughs> Digging his own grave, which is, <laughs> I mean, it's a real, it's a, it, he's doing a real thing and it's also a metaphor also. So <laughs> it works on every level. Yeah. And eventually you're not only digging, you're actually standing in the grave as you dig. I yeah. mean, it's uh, it, it's a lot. Yeah. He's half buried <laughs> by the time John Locke visits him. Yeah. The, speaking of the just the whole thing about how you you know we, we weren't really so manipulative and and cut through it deep down, I, I feel like that actually kind of comes to roost here, where you're where you're kind of begging and groveling for your life, and you're offering Miles the you know the three point two million dollars that you had once promised him, and say, mm -hmm. well, how, how are you going to get that for me? And right, you know, you're you're, you're insist Miles has his number, and it, it, his offers are so transparent; they're so feeble. It's like, oh, it's pitiable and desperate. <laughs> yeah, and I felt the same thing when you were trying to convince Alana that, you know, you hadn't really killed Jacob after Miles, you know, does his does his thing. It's like, oh, that that wasn't me. You can't believe him. And it's, you know, this character we've come to know is this this incredible liar and manipulator. It's yeah. just, he, he has nothing. I mean, he really has nothing anymore. Yeah, he, puts, he, he tries to put it on Miles. He, he tries to impugn mm -hmm. the whole idea of, you know, psychics or visionaries or whatever, like, yeah, it's laughable, isn't it? Yeah. But it's, it's so transparent. Right. It's, it's become sad now that it's no longer effective. It's very, it's very yeah. sad. He has, no, he has no cards. He never had very many cards, but he has zero cards in this episode. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like he doesn't know what else to do, but keep trying to play them. True. And just worm his way out. Yeah. And, but, just the fact that he's, his life has been spared, it do, doesn't make him a popular guy. But, you know, Sun does let him help her stretch the fabric over the lean-to. It's a small thing. A very small thing, for, for the which he is so grateful. He's like a, he's like a kid at a new school and just desperate to be accepted. Mm. Mm. And maybe that, maybe that's, maybe that's his essence. He just, he just wanted to be accepted. But he went about it wrong. <laughs> yeah. I think there's more, there's more to get into with Dr. Linus, but let's, let's back up just a minute before we do like the other storyline in it. The, the last time we talked to you was in was in back in season four, and there was all sorts of other stuff happening. So just to, to quickly get up to speed, the the big setup for this season, as we've already referenced, is that you know the end of season five, the the stabbing of Jacob. Um, really, just wanted to make sure we asked you about that scene because it's it's one of the best and best scenes in the show. It might be my favorite scene in the show, where you know where you give the where you give the speech, you know, being marched right up to you as if you were Moses. What about me? What about me? Um, can you just 
talk a little bit about filming that scene and what, what you were going, and, and I guess I'm just curious, what, what do you think made that scene so powerful? Because it's, 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 you know, I could watch it again and again and not get tired of it. It seems like the truth of his character is, re is revealed mm -hmm. in that scene, that he's, he hasn't confidence or power. He hasn't a way with people. He was the neglected child. That's it. That's, that's what he's got going on. That's his, that's his hand. And to, to have him say it so plainly, there's no, there's no bargain anymore. There's no argument. He's just, it's a, it's a confession and it's desperate and it sounds desperate in his own ears. It sounds pathetic. And what a, f what a fool I have been. How could you? How dare you? The, the neglected child thing is interesting to me because, of course, it makes me think not only did Ben kill his actual father, he then kills the sort of, you know, godlike father figure of Jacob. Yeah. yeah. It's like he has no other way to relate. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's true. Do you remember filming that scene? Just what it was like there in the, I'm sure you weren't really in a giant statue of a foot, but I, I imagine that must've been a pretty intense evening with, uh, with Terry and Mark Pellegrino. Yeah, we were in a, we were in a claustrophobic space. It was like a temple space underneath the giant foot. Mm -hmm. And it really was. No, I take that back. What? God, where was it? It had to have been on a set somewhere, right? Yeah, it was on. It, well, it was on a soundstage, because we had that business of a person catching fire, and right. that, that's what I chiefly remember is all the anxiety about the because there's a guy, a professional stunt person, and his specialty is he can be set on fire. No kidding! Wow. And, and it looks kind of like Jacob's clothes, but it's actually flame retardant stuff and a wig. He's got his, his head and face are covered with this flame retardant material. It's all very tricky and technical. And then there's this whole protocol and you run it many times of him getting on fire. They cover him in this flammable gel. And I, it was it was terrifying. Wow! I thought, wow. I hope no, I hope nothing goes wrong here, because it, it wasn't like it's like he bursts in the flame, which he did, and then he rolls around for a while. They he had choreography. I don't was it Jack Bender directing? Must must have been when Definitely. all the really crazy stuff happens. It's usually with Jack, and so he had we had like a five count. Roll, 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 roll. Fire extinguishers. And five people came in with, you know, pouring flame retardant on this burning stuntman. And he had, uh, he had the fireproof mask, but I think it had a straw that came out of it so that he could breathe. I don't, it was a, it was, it was a very elaborate. And, and I've gone on about it too long here, but it, uh, that's about all I could think about. I mean, we did the scene. The scene, the scene seemed really straightforward. I just thought it was so well written and it seemed like finally Ben gets this thing off his chest mm -hmm. all these years, all this blind obedience for what? Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you though. If I had watched a man be set on fire repeatedly, I don't know that I'd remember much else that happened surrounding that either. It it was big, and they did it yeah. two or three times. That's wild. It, it, it's the kind of thing you feel like, geez, wasn't it good enough on the first one? But I don't think he rolled around enough, or something, <laughs> something like that. Oh gosh. The the other thing that happens at the end of season five is that, you know, Terry O'Quinn, the body of John Locke returns, but he's this completely different person at that point. And all of a sudden he's really manipulating Ben to his own ends. What do you remember about working with 
Terry playing this completely. I mean, it's Sammy and I have been talking as we watch this back. It's so obvious from the jump that he's someone completely different. Um, but what was it like maintaining like that working relationship with such a different character? It was well, it was strange, and you know, it took some it took some adjusting to, it. and you had to keep reminding yourself that it's, that it's a different deal now. Um, I guess my basic tone with Terry, wh whoever he was, whatever season you're talking about, it was an antagonistic or prickly relationship. So I, I guess we, we continued to play that. I can't remember if I made up my mind to what extent I bought this transformation mm -hmm. or if I thought it was a trick. Like, I, I can't really remember. <laughs> there were, but there were so many questions in yeah. The, and I think, I think what's sort of implied in the show is that, you know, Ben has murdered John Locke a few episodes prior to this. Yeah. And then it's sort of, maybe it's a resurrection or something supernatural is going on. And it takes quite a while, I think, for, for us to realize like, no, this is, <laughs> this is something even bigger and even weirder than that. Yeah, that's right. I can't remember how the, the new Terry introduced himself to Ben. I, I can't remember the circumstances un under which. Well, it's, it, it was sort of what happens is that after the stabbing scene, you sort of realize he's a different person. And then they, they take, they, Richard pulls you out and shows you Locke's body on the ground at, at the start of the sixth season. Um, so that, that's when you realize, oh, this isn't John Locke. But I don't know, it just, it, it's just such a different dynamic right away. I mean, in the first episode of the season, he makes this very dramatic speech to you do you want to know what he was thinking while, while you, you choked the life out of him, Benjamin? He was thinking, I don't understand. It was the, the saddest thing I've ever heard. And then he just, he's insulting John Locke to you. And it just, it, it just becomes very different right away. I mean, the dynamic between That's you guys right. changes, com right. changes completely. Yeah. He, he spends the whole season trying to line you up on his side and, uh, you That's know, get right. you to work for him. And he was no, he was no longer the pitiable John Locke. Right. He of he of the wheelchair and the sad backstory. Now he was something else. He was he was like demon John Locke or something, but on a very subtle level. Yeah, that, that's yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> the um, you know, and as long as we're talking about Ben and Locke, the other great scene this season, outside of Doctor Linus, that we should bring up um, is the funeral for Locke when you eulogize him. Um, and you say something to the effect of, he was a better man, he was a believer, he was a better man than I will ever be, and I'm very sorry that I murdered him. You kind of reveal that to everyone at the funeral, and, and everyone, Frank Lapita says something to the effect, the weirdest damn funeral I've ever been to. <laughs> and I, 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 it's I, very I, funny. I assume you guys were playing that for laughs, because it's hard not to crack up watching that. I mean, half the time it did seem like we were in a comedy. <laughs> a, a lot of that stuff I mean yeah when Terry became the other it, it was it was a little hard to well because on some level it was funny on or antic or what's the right word not not to be taken quite so naturalistically serious. We had gone into another realm. <laughs> and it yeah. became it became a kind of adventure fairy story. <laughs> had more of that kind of it always had a fairy tale quality to the show. But then in it was so tricky to juggle the different the, the different other dimensions. Yeah. 
Well, let's talk the other dimension. Let's go back to Dr. Linus. I mean, you, they, they've introduced, first of all, this whole alternate you know, universe storyline, which we later find out is the afterlife. Uh, you know, there's no more flashbacks. There's no more flash forward. It's now the sort of flash sideways. Um, just what, what did you make of that when, when, when you found out, okay, they're going to be doing these different versions of our characters and I'm going to be playing this, you know, sideways version of myself, Dr. Linus. Did, did you like that? Did it confuse you? Did it excite you? I'm just, what, what did you make of that whole device that they had? I, I liked it, even if I wasn't always sure how it worked. But I, I, I did like the, I thought it was charming and heartbreaking to see the things that might have been, that not just Benjamin, but a, a lot of people on the island c could have had this better life, a, a thing more satisfying, with more love in it. And, all of that. So it was a, a relief in a way, cathartic, I would say, to play t tenderly, to be a regular person with regular feelings, heartsick or sad or timid or all those qualities that we didn't play for so many seasons. And now, now Benjamin Linus is a nebbishy school teacher with bad haircut and not much of a home life. And nerdy glasses too. You can't forget the, the nerdy glasses. <laughs> Those are actually my own glasses. <laughs> I, I, I use nerdy as a positive. I'm a nerd. Myself. No, it, no, no, they absolutely were. I mean, I, and I, I, I wore those kind of glasses for years. <laughs> One of the things that's that's really funny about the alternate reality in this episode is that there is this little plot line where Dr. Linus has the opportunity to force the principles. It's like there's this still tendon there's still this tendency toward power or a desire for power, and then he ends up giving it up and saying, yeah. No, I don't need that. I can simply, you know, help Alex, this student that I care about and um, and step away from it. And it is really nice to think about a universe somewhere where Ben has the, the faculties to make that choice. He, he has in all his lives uh, a, a kind of a, a, a desire to play a big hand, you know, to mm -hmm. make, the, make a big bargain where he prevails. But in, in all of his lives, he doesn't count on the other person being, or the world or fate, being more powerful and devious than he can ever dream of being. So he gets whipped. The principal whips him, just like the island whips him. Fortunately, in this case, he, he makes the right call. He, he chooses the good of the daughter figure over, you know, trying to force his hand. Well, one thing that I think is really interesting about that choice, obviously it's to help Alex, who specifically cares about that this I mean, there's a, there's a line in one of your scenes with um, the other teacher, Les Leslie Arst, returning to the cast played by Daniel Roebuck, who's very, very funny. Um, <laughs> and you have a scene with him where uh, you say to him, taking care of the kids, that's what's important. Um, and I just thought that was a, interesting that the choice with Ben's character in the story and the choice to make him a teacher, that he cares about educating children and, and students, um, I, I just I was just sort of found myself wondering where where that comes from or why that was the choice was it was it an outgrowth of the fact that his his love for Alex was like his one redeeming quality in the original timeline or or is it a factor of his uh, you know the poor upbringing that he that he got from his father and he doesn't want to replicate that I just I thought it was interesting to make him a teacher and to make this caring for the children kind of the central element of his character here well because it, it it's a nice parallel or echo for 
his life with Alex on the island. But I, I, I suppose the writer sat down and said, what is a what is a profession where you be you can be a father figure without being a parent and a teacher probably seems like a good one yeah that that makes that, sense. that that always made that always made sense to me you you smile but oh, go ahead i'm sorry you're going to say something. and ben ben is ben was always a little pedantic he, he, he was, you know he he had the book club and he loved to protest right. and yeah. Right. All of those things. Yeah, he was a, a, a nerd playing above his level. <laughs> he's, he's playing above his level when he tries to pull that one on the principal. You know, that's not, he just didn't think through how many things could go wrong with that particular setup. <laughs> Definitely. And I was just going to cut in that uh, when I mentioned Arst, uh, Daniel Roebuck, you smiled. I, I imagine you have some recollection of working with him and, and probably how funny he was. Oh, yeah. Well, he was, he was funny. And then, I, but who can forget that, you know, it's the dynamite brings back how he met his end, you know, in that, in the island world. And Hurley said something about how, how long it took him to wash him out of his t-shirt or something yes. like that that's funny that you remember that was before you were on the show even <laughs> that's a good rec that's a good recollection um yeah the the other character that you get to i mean you, obviously there are several characters who come back here you get to you get to play with john grease again who played your father roger linus and it's very different um you get to work with with tanya again and uh mira ferglin who played rousseau uh, just kind, of, just kind of curious if you have any recollections of. I mean, it, it, you know, not just you're not just playing your your new Benjamin, but you're playing new versions of these characters as well, yeah. and kind of having very different relationships with them. I, I wonder what that was like. It was sweet, you know, to to play that kind of budding domestic romance with Mira, and you know, have that whole set of tenderer feelings. She's not, you know, this dangerous master of weapons living in the jungle. She's, you know, a homemaker and they're kind of feeling their way toward being able to help each other in life or being there for one another. So I thought that was really a, a sweet change up and then uh, Tanya, you know, she's so wonderful in that episode. She's like, oh, the, the budding promise of a young intellect and artist. Just, <laughs> she's fantastic. She is. It's, um, I mean, it's kind of, it's beautiful to watch. It's also so sad to watch knowing how, how things ended in life for her and for you. It's, <laughs> It's beautiful, but it's also painful to think that this is what might have been. I think that that whole episode is like a poignancy machine. <laughs> it puts the squeeze on us because we can't watch any of this tenderer, more real life stuff without comparing it to all the bad stuff that it's reflecting yeah. <laughs> in the island life. Yeah, this is it's a very little thing, but one of my favorite lines of the episode was when, when you're making plans with her to do some early morning tutoring to replace the lost history, the the history club that got canceled, and you say to her, seven a.m. meet in the library. You bring the coffee, and for some reason, I was just especially struck by you bring the coffee because it made me realize this: it's not a one way street, the relationship between you know teacher and and student. That you felt comfortable saying that to her, I think you know, yeah. spoke, to, spoke to the real relationship that was there. Yeah, I thought it was a nice touch yeah. too on the part of the writers that, and, and of course that one of the themes of the episode, if, if not the series is bargains. Mm -hmm. I give this, I get that in return, you know that. So here's, here's a, a tiny bargain that helps to balance that relationship. 
in this day and age, I might have had more questions about uh, the proximity of the teacher and the student in a dark library on the off hours. I, I thought, oh, we would not shoot that today. Mm, that's interesting. That, that just seems interesting. Maybe not as appropriate <laughs> as you might want. I mean, we had no reason to fear that anything untoward was going to happen, but it was kind of. <laughs> totally yeah. fair. Totally fair. Man, I, it, I, I listened to this before I watched Dr. Linus this week, and I just kept thinking about he gambled with the best things in his life and he lost. Like, mm. what a better way to sum it up. Yeah, that, that's even better than the line that I wrote down from the interview is the sum up, which was he was a nerd playing above his level. Yeah. <laughs> it really does seem to get at this idea that Ben was always meant to be Dr. Linus. And he was not meant to lead lead a society to like, you know, lead an army to kind of move heaven and earth and, you know, order assassinations and do all of the crazy shit that he does. Like circumstances gave him that. But in terms of his his personality, teaching European history seems like a good fit. Well, two things. One, you know, just like talking about Ben <laughs> ordering assassinations and shit, as you say, it reminds me that. One point I meant to raise when we were talking about Richard is that just like sort of adding to, you know, the fact that he wants to end his life here is that he's just come from the come from the temple where he has like found everyone brutally murdered, it right. seems, which had to have been traumatic. But it, it also just started making me think about the purge again mm. and remembering that Richard, I feel like we haven't talked about this much, like Richard was fundamental to the purge. Like Ben might have been the yeah. instrument through which it was carried out, but it seems like Richard was, you know, if not the mastermind, then one of them. Yeah. So I just like I was feeling sympathetic for Richard and what he's going through and showing up at the temple and finding all of his people dead. But then I was thinking, gee, you know, this is I don't want to say Richard had this coming necessarily, but he did the same thing to another group of people. Mm. Like the monster purged the others after, you know, Richard purged Dharma. So, right. you know, it's like I don't want to let Richard off the hook for that either. Well, right. And I and maybe part of Richard's despair here is holy shit, I've done some bad stuff and I thought I was mm. doing it for mm. a reason and it turns out I wasn't. And so what do I do with that now? You know, is that That's on me? Like, do I have to live with that guilt? Do I, is that something else to blame Jacob for? I mean, that opens up a whole can of worms. That, that's an excellent, excellent point, and I'm, I, I love that. I'm sure that's playing into his mind. Yeah. Even, even more than it is for Ben, because Richard's been doing it a lot longer, which is probably why he's in an even darker place than, yeah, than Ben he is. Has... At, the, at the beginning of the conversation with Emerson, we, we talked a bit about, like, who is, what is Ben's essence? I forget if the word essence came up, mm -hmm. but it's like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this applies to Richard, too, but since we're talking about Ben, it's like, who is Ben deep down? And it just, this is, this will get real metaphysical real fast if we pursue it. But it just, it made me start to think like, what is anyone's essence really? Like, is there, is there any part of someone that's so deep and immutable that, you know, it can't be changed with work or that it never goes away or that you're always kind of contending with it and you can't get past it? Like, cause you know, until this episode and we talked, like we talked about Emerson, my read of Ben was that, you know, deep down his essence is that he's this, you know, manipulative and and you know lying and you know just power hungry person um and that that's his whole life's work is trying to get around that or get past that and you know emerson's response is no 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 like deep down he was really this other guy that you see in dr linus and it's this bill of goods that he sold himself but you know is is he one of those things trying to work around it is there is is there some whichever way that he really quote unquote really is is that something that's immutable and it's just a question of holding it at bay you know and not succumbing to it or can you really change who you are that that's what i found myself thinking about after this all i love season six um yeah yeah i mean i think that's what the flash sideways mechanism does so effectively is say what if you took the same person with much of the same history and simply place them in different circumstances, right? So in Dr. Linus, the circumstances that he didn't stay on the, he didn't stay to grow up on the island. He didn't stay long enough to 
come to hate his father. Maybe his father didn't stay long enough to start drinking so heavily. And, you know, maybe that one intervention was the, was like the butterfly effect idea, right? Where Mm. that one change and it's a big change, but that was enough to set Ben on this entirely different course. Right. And we see that a lot of the same impulses are still at work within him. He does. I, the principal calls him Machiavellian at one point, which is a great word for Ben. Um, you know, that's that's in there, but it's just so much more muted. I don't know that it's about being held at bay so much as if, like, everything would be horrible if this got out. But it's just like the stakes are lower. Um, mm. the, the circumstances are just different. Um, so, yeah, I think I think his essence, such as it is kind of is the same like he has the same impulses he has the same self-regard that makes him want to seek power because he believes he can do it well um but he also has you know care for alex and and care for these other people which complicates that and i think those are ben's essence huh so is, is that anything? I, I think that not only do I do I agree with everything you just said, but it's it's setting me on this this path here that I'm going to try to quickly go down because it, it makes me think like one the island was the problem for Ben. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. you know if he, if he always had those same instincts and it's just like seemingly it was the island that he couldn't you know the the allure and the the power and the lore of the island he couldn't stop himself or he you know he was so overwhelmed by it that he couldn't be that person that he really wanted to be and he had alex there he had the love right. for alex just like he did in the sideways but right. but was it the island or was it just jacob because once jacob right. is dead and gone um you know it seems like ben might be able to figure out a way to live the rest of his existence on the island and be the person he wants to be i mean Maybe maybe yeah. the island is a beautiful thing, and, and Jacob, in his own way, just like the man in black, was a corrupting influence on the place and on the people who took up residence there. Yeah, I mean, you used the phrase earlier, he sold himself a bill of goods. I think he used that phrase even, and I think I was oh. borrowing that from him. Yeah, Emerson, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Like, he, I think Jacob sold him a bill of goods via Richard, and Ben was ready to buy it because it it sort of fit some preconceived notions that he had about himself and well that was intentional they were they were playing right. to his instincts they were right. playing to his desire for power which i'm sure jacob sensed within him right right so yeah i think i think i think you're right jacob was the problem you know he cuz he was manipulating ben and richard toward his ends so he was he was using what what in, in like Christian jargon, we would call their gifts and talents, right? Like their, their natural <laughs> instincts. Um, he recognized those and he played to their strengths to his own end. You know, whatever happened to them, be damned, right? And there's just no Jacob in the sideways. There's nobody saying, well, we need to choose to not care about Alex's future. This is too important. There's nobody to say that. And so he can yeah. actually listen to his own instincts, which I think are are probably better, right? Like... Because that, that's what tells him to back off and let Alex get this this recommendation that she needs. And um, yeah, I think, I think Ben probably had those instincts and Jacob just pushed him over the edge, right? The one other thing it brings to my mind is the, the line of dialogue where, where Miles says to Ben, I can't believe you're just going to stand by and watch this happen. Elon's going to murder me for killing Jacob, a man who didn't even care about being killed. No, he cared. Excuse me? Right up until the second the knife went through his heart. He was hoping he was wrong about you. I guess he wasn't. I, I just think now that we're in such a negative place about Jacob, like I've become so negative on Jacob this year. <laughs> Sorry to Mark Pellegrino. Um, you know, there's there's one way to interpret that line of, you know, he was hoping he was wrong about you because he cared about you and he wanted you to be good. But I think the the darker way to interpret it, which I'm inclined to buy into now, is because because Miles starts by saying ben, ben says he was a man who didn't even care about being killed, mm-hmm. and Miles says no, he cared. You know, he, he was hoping he was wrong about you right up until the last second. I think he was just hoping he was wrong about Ben because he didn't want Ben to kill him in that moment. Yeah, and hoping I'm wrong about you doesn't necessarily mean I think you're going to make the wrong choice, and I want you to make the like morally and ethically correct choice. 
it could mean I thought I could manipulate you and now mm. I'm afraid that you're rebelling against me and I hope I'm wrong about that. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like I want, I think I'm thinking about like the Dungeons and Dragons alignments, right? Like there is the lawful to chaotic scale and then there's the good to evil scale. And Jacob is lawful, right? And obedience to Jacob is lawful. That doesn't make it good. Huh. Is that anything? I think that's something. Are we, do we want to categorize Jacob as lawful evil and the man in black as chaotic evil? Honestly, kind of. The island is is neutral good, maybe? Probably. Is that Would that be the term? Neutral good? I agree, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's neither lawful nor chaotic, but I think it is good. Yeah. Mm. Folks, if you want to weigh in on our Dungeons & Dragons rating <laughs> scale of the island and its power players, or if you perhaps have much more faith in Jacob and or God than we do. Um, I shouldn't speak for Rosie, than I do on the God aspect. <laughs> Give us a call. 9546 Dharma is the number. Uh, this is a topic that could go on for a while, but try to keep it to 60 seconds or less. We've got not that many episodes left, and we'd love to hear from you. Next up is Recon, which is a Sawyer flash sideways. A lot of fun. And we'll have more from our conversation with Michael Emerson. Sammy already mentioned it. We'll say it again. You can leave us a hot take by calling 9546-DHARMA. If you are outside the U.S., just use the country code 1 at the beginning. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or iHeart or wherever you're listening, rate the podcast, leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. You can also chat with us on Twitter at The Hatch Podcast and at Facebook.com slash The Hatch Podcast. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen. Our cover art is by Danny Roth. See you next time. Namaste. Namaste.